This lecture examines the development of Imperial Russia. By Imperial Russia, we mean when Russia gradually became an empire. It had moved away from its early roots as centered around the cities of Kiev, Novgorod, or Moscow, and now it has clearly thrown off the Tartar yoke, has clearly pushed back on the Mongol invasions from the east, and now begins to expand its dominions as far away as the Pacific Ocean, even up to Siberia, and expanded its southern borders down to the Crimea. You remember that Imperial Russia really emerges after a great, a very difficult time period in Russian history known as the Time of Troubles. Russia really enjoy, en, endures several periods of time that we could call times of troubles. These are periods in which there is no strong central authority. There really is no strong central czar. And the country is ravaged by civil wars and conflicts, rivalries between noble families, between the boyars. And so as a result of these boyar revolts and conflicts, and also some invaders from the west in the kingdom of the Poles, and also a very severe famine at the end of the 16th century, Russia was in many ways on its knees, and there really was no clear line of succession to who would inherit the throne. It was in desperate need of strong central leadership. That leadership finally emerges in the ascension of Michael Romanov to the throne. This is a very significant event in Russian history and marks the beginning of the Romanov dynasty. The Romanovs, of course, will last over 300 years and will endure all the way until the Russian Revolution, where the last Romanov monarch is finally deposed. But amidst all this conflict, even the boyars realize that they must elect a new czar and commence a new dynasty in order to uh, return peace to Russia. Therefore, Zemsky Sobor, which is a national assembly often composed of nobles and members of the clergy of the church and also some representatives of the people, came together and unanimously elected Michael Romanov on February 21st, 1613. There have been many other options that the Zemsky Sobor had considered, including monarchs from Poland and Sweden to come and rule over Russia. But alas, in February 1613, Michael Romanov is chosen. It's interesting, initially his mother protested her son's election to the Russian throne, believing and even stating that her son was too young and too tender for such a difficult office in such a difficult time. But nevertheless, Michael Romanov is very instrumental in helping expand Russia all the way to the Pacific Ocean, also instrumental in expanding the gradually expanding Russian Empire even up into Siberia, and also instrumental in gradually subduing the Cossacks to the southern, on the southern border. Thus, 1613 is a very consequential year in the history of Russia, and particularly its monarchy, as this marks the beginning of the Romanov dynasty. And as you can see, this dynasty is going to last over 300 years, not to end until the year of the revolution in 1917, with the abdication of Nicholas II, who will be the last Romanov. But the Romanov family is very instrumental in forming the empire of Russia, very um, significant in expanding uh, Russia eventually as an industrial power, and really is responsible for the creation of so much of the modern Russian state. We can see from this map how the dominions of Russia, those areas that the monarchy ruled over, gradually expanded somewhat to the west, but significantly into the south, conquering these remaining khanates, these small enclaves or almost individual kingdoms left over from Tartar Mongol invaders on their southern border, and is also instrumental in expanding the empire all the way up uh, into Siberia and all the way east to the Pacific Ocean. Michael Romanov's son, who ascended to the throne in 1645 with Alexis I. Alexis I is very instrumental in expanding the Russian Empire. By the time of his death, Russia spanned almost 2 trillion acres and, of course, easily becomes the largest power, largest uh, country by land mass in Europe 
and is still today the largest country in the world. A large part of Alexis' success in expanding the empire took place against the Cossacks. The Cossacks were these bands of Slavic-speaking Russian Orthodox warriors who emerged north of the Russian steppe uh, in the early development of Russia. Uh, the Cossacks were often self-governing communities and at time even resisted the power of the czars over their lands. They were very fearsome warriors, almost like mercenary bands. And the Romanovs, particularly Alexis, were, un were usually successful in subduing the Cossacks and redirecting their military endeavors against Russia's enemies. So a great triumph of the early Romanovs were incorporating the Cossacks to think of themselves as more loyal to the Russian state and to the Tsar, almost like a personal private army for the Tsar. And gradually the Cossacks will be worked into regular army units in the Russian army and will continue to serve in the First and Second World War. And they're actually those that trace their lineage to the Cossacks in the Russian army today. The Cossacks often fought the Turks to the south. Of course, the Ottoman Empire is a very large empire to on the south of Russia's borders. And often the Cossacks were instrumental in beating back uh, invasions from the south and were also important in defeating Russia's enemies that would invade from the west. Also, at times, the Cossacks would serve the Romanovs as a police force as well as border guards. Here's a picture of the Cossacks being instrumental in expanding dominions into Siberia with the conquest of Siberia. Now, after the time of troubles and this great period of civil war and conflict, there's a great problem for the Russian state, particularly a lack of money. In fact, the monarchy and the state is almost on the verge of bankruptcy. Therefore, Tsar Alexis endeavored to replenish the state treasury after the time of troubles with a new salt tax. Now, throughout history, particularly European history, salt taxes are often the most hated of all taxes because, of course, without refrigeration, the only way one could preserve meat was by having it heavily salted to reduce and eliminate the bacteria that would otherwise consume the meat. And the Russian diet at this time was heavily dependent upon salted fish particularly among the lower classes. So therefore, in response to this salt tax, large-scale rioting, particularly in Moscow, broke out, resulting in the destruction of even half of the city of Moscow, the rioting and the burning and evidence uh, uh, episodes of arson is so uh, significant. Alexis also launched wars against the kingdoms of Poland and Sweden to expand his empire, and of course wars uh, require money. So therefore, the Russian treasury minted new copper coins to finance these wars, and it sparked inflation and indeed additional riots known as the Copper Riots. So the salt riots and also the copper riots uh, certainly represent a threat to Alexis's throne and his authority. Another key event during the reign of Tsar Alexis was the split of the old believers. Tsar Alexis... Uh, among the early Romanovs, and certainly very similar to his famous grandson, Peter the Great, believed that Russia was behind. What we see a trend among many of the Romanovs is a recognition that Europe has far surpassed Russia and that Russia is bogged down by old-fashioned ways and its old traditions, and it needs to be modernized. Therefore, Alexis endeavored to modernize the church under the recommendations of the Patriot Nikon and develop contemporary worship much more like the Greek Orthodox Church. He wanted the Russian Orthodox Church to be more like the more modern Greek Orthodox Church. Therefore, many members and leaders of the Russian Orthodox Church rejected these changes and broke away from the main Russian Orthodox Church and became known as the Old Believers, those holding on to old traditions in the old worship styles. The Old Believers maintained that a worshiper should only make the sign of the cross with two fingers, rather than the Greek practice of using three fingers to make the sign of the cross. They also insisted that men and the clergy should grow beards. 
The endurance of the old believers reveals the preference for tradition and the Russian past instead of modernizing trends. And this, of course, will be an important development as we continue to look at uh, the reign of Peter the Great, whose reforms and modernizing efforts will often target these old traditional beliefs of the old believers. Now, it's, of course, important for a czar to have an heir to the throne, and Tsar Alexis conducts what was quite common in medieval Europe and among medieval monarchs in having a bridal parade. And in a bridal parade, often the Tsar's advisors would solicit contestants throughout the empire of some of the most beautiful, young, available women to, be, to line up before the Tsar and one of them to be chosen as his wife. So therefore, the winner of this Tsardom-wide contest, organized by Alexis' chief uh, advisor, was uh, a young girl named Maria Miloslavskaya. Alexis's first marriage to Maria Miloslavskaya was harmonious and he was happy. She bore him many children, uh, including some sons and daughters, in their 21 years of marriage including an heir to the throne who would eventually become Fyodor III. Unfortunately, Maria died a few weeks after giving birth to their 13th child. After the death of Maria Miloslavskaya, Alexis remarried in February of 1671 to Natalia Nerishkina. As a result, Alexis's reign we consider certainly very successful, very important for the expansion of the Russian Empire, and that he also did not allow Russia to collapse back into the time of troubles where there was no clear heir to the throne. He provided an heir to the throne through his first marriage in Fyodor III. Now, Fyodor was not a particularly strong monarch. He did ascend to uh, the throne in 1676, and he was known to have a very noble disposition uh, he had received a very excellent education. Uh, besides his native Russian, he knew Polish and even Latin. He seemed to be generous and gracious. However, Fyodor had been disabled from birth. He had been horribly disfigured and half paralyzed from a mysterious disease. Historians today uh, suspect that that disease was probably scurvy. Scurvy uh, is induced when there is an acute lack of vitamins, particularly vitamin C. And it can have rather uh, horrifying, disfiguring results on the human body. And so that is a good possibility that that's what Fyodor's condition was. And so as a result, he does not reign long, only about six years. And he dies in 1682 without fathering any surviving children. And thus, once again, Russia was with out an heir to the throne. With the death of Fyodor, this without an heir, this leads to a great moment of significance in the history of the Russian monarchy. Conflict and dispute once again broke out between two family members of whom they had a member married to the previous Tsar Alexis. So, in other words, the family of Maria Miloslavskaya and the family of Natalia Nerishkina both claimed that they had an, uh, a descendant of Alexis who should be the legitimate heir to the throne. Now, to resolve this dispute, the Russian throne passed to co-rulers. It was the first time in Russian history that they had two czars. One was Ivan V, who was age 16, and the other was Peter the first, who is age 10. Now, because the boys were so young, the sister of Ivan the v fifth and the half-sister of Peter the first acted as a regent until the boys reached their maturity. In other words, a regent is not technically the ruler, not technically the monarch, but certainly is instrumental and helps the younger heirs to the throne to rule until they come to maturity, usually at the age of 18, and often makes a lot of decisions for them and exercises broad influence over them. So we can see from this chart that Alexis, Tsar Alexis I's marriage to Maria Milosovskaya produced an heir to the throne in Fyodor III, 
but because of his ailments, he did not last long. And as a result, his brother, Ivan V, came to the throne. However, Alexis I also had a second marriage after his first wife died to Natalia Nereshkina, and their child was Peter. So both of them had a legitimate claim to the throne, both of them being young, however. Sophia, the sister of Ivan and the half-sister of Peter, acted as a regent. So therefore, we have two czars for the first time in Russian history. So on June 25th, 1682, less than two months after the death of Fyodor III, Ivan and Peter were crowned in the Cathedral of the Dormition, which is a traditional cathedral in the Moscow Kremlin where czars were crowned, as double czars. In fact, a special throne with two seats was commissioned for the occasion, for the crowning, in which Peter and Ivan would both sit on the throne and receive the crown. But you can see that a window was cut out behind the throne. This window was for their sister and half-sister, Sophia, to stick her head and to whisper to the young heirs to the throne, the young czars, what her decisions were and to help them rule. And uh, th that's why the crown was created uh, in that manner. So as a result, when Ivan was 16 years old at the time, his co-ruler, his co Peter I, was only 10. Now, Ivan was considered the senior czar, but actual power was actually wielded by their sister Sophia, Ivan's sister and Peter's half-sister, for the first seven years. Now, among the co-rulers, Ivan V was certainly inferior to Peter I. He was inferior in health, and certainly abilities than his half-brother, Peter I. Ivan was often confined to his bed, and he was definitely mentally and physically handicapped, including being partially blind. Now, Ivan would have never reached the throne if it were not for the efforts of his very dominating and controlling, manipulative sister, Sophia. Sophia was often supported in her efforts by the Streltsy, the Streltsy were an armed infantry battalion that would often serve and guard the Moscow Kremlin. They become a very important um, portion of the infantry, one of the earliest units to actually be armed in the Russian army. They also, from a, on, on occasion, would serve as a fire brigade uh, in defending the Kremlin from fire. So thus, with the support of the Streltsy, and particularly her branch of the family, the Miloslavskayas, the Streltsy and Sophia are able to exercise undue and exaggerated influence over the co-rulers, and particularly over I Ivan, through the efforts of the Streltsy. Now, the Streltsy were often manipulated to have their efforts and their focus directed against the other part of Alexis's family, the Nereshkinas, and particularly the heir to the throne, Peter I. Peter I was often teased and harassed, even threatened. He worried that he would be murdered by the Streltsy upon the order of Sophia so that his half-brother Ivan V would, control the, would uh, occupy the throne by himself, even though under the influence of Sophia. Uh, Sophia. So as a result, we can see that there's a great division uh, between these two families represented in these two boys that ascend to the throne. Now, upon, the, uh, upon turning the, to the age of 17, P Peter had had enough. And because he was a very strong personality and strong, uh, even tall, physically imposing, he declared the end of the regency of his half-sister at the age of 17 and his intention to rule as sole czar. Now, Ivan did not challenge his half-brother and endorsed his ascension to being sole czar of Russia. Because Ivan was mentally impaired, he actually uh, pr preferred the rulership of his brother, and Peter appreciated that as a result. Therefore, Ivan retired into virtual obscurity. He did get married and bear several children. He married a wife who tenderly looked after him and bore him five daughters, including the future Russian Empress Anna. Peter forced his hated half-sister Sophia to give up all her royal titles 
and thereafter be confined to a convent for the remainder of her life. Thus, we can mark 1682, very important a date, as marking the beginning of the very consequential reign of Peter I, Peter Romanov, the first Roman, uh, the first Russian monarch to earn the title of the Great. Now, Peter the First, or Peter the Great, was named after the Apostle Peter. He was, uh, from the very early age, described as a very healthy and robust and very inquisitive child, which, of course, made the contrast with his half-brother Ivan even more acute. He was well-educated under the tutelage of some of the best tutors in Russia. As a 10-year-old boy, Peter had witnessed the Streltsy murder several of his family members and his friends. That made a lasting impression on him. So he's going to be very sensitive regarding the threat of rebellion and often... Uh, express his rage and violence, particularly against the Streltsy, but any of those that he suspected plotting against him and his throne. Peter expressed as a young child an interest in shipbuilding and military matters from an early age, and he even assembled a large toy army. Peter grew to be extremely tall for the time period, at six feet eight inches. That was almost unheard of for someone to be that tall at six foot eight. He became an independent sovereign, particularly by banishing his mother, finally at the age of 22. Peter is very tall, very broad-chested, but had unusually small feet and hands and even a small head compared to the larger um, size of the rest of his body. So nevertheless, he was a very imposing figure and was also known for his sheer physical strength those that would often shake his hand complained about their hand hurting after shaking hands with the famous Tsar. Now, at a young age, Peter forced, uh, Peter's mother forced him to marry a daughter of a notable boyar only when he was 17 years old. This was Edukia Lupokina. Now, Peter really had no interest and no love ever for Edukia Lupokina. Uh, Edukia was... Uh, certainly very traditional, very conservative, very shy, uh, very uh, introverted, which was certainly uh, not Peter's taste when it came to women. Um, and he never expressed uh, much interest in her, although she did bear Peter several sons and daughters, uh, most of them not uh, surviving their childhood. Uh, as a result, Peter divorced her and sent her, a con sent her to a convent in 1698. Now, Utekia, before she was banished, did bear Peter a son. This is Alexis. And as his first marriage, as the oldest surviving son of his first marriage, Alexis was slated to be heir to the throne. However, because Peter really despised his first wife, took very little interest in her, he also took very little interest in his son, the product of this marriage. And so as a result, Alexis grows up with little attention and tutelage from his father, and uh, it takes up very few of the military, engineering, and naval interests of his father, and more or less becomes a dissolute youth, uh, also an alcoholic at a young age, and is much more concerned with his mistress than the affairs of the state and being prepared to become a czar. Now, at one point after Peter the Great banishes Edukia to this monastery, he hears that his ex-wife has taken a lover at the convent. Now, mind you, Peter had many mistresses uh, in his own personal life, but upon hearing that his ex-wife took this lover at the convent, Peter ordered her lover to be drawn and quartered while Edukia was forced to watch. In other words, he had both arms and both legs ripped off of his torso at the same time in excruciating pain and torture. Upon the ascension of her grandson to the throne, Edukia was eventually freed from the convent and allowed to live in Moscow, but that was many years later. Now, Peter the Great has a very different childhood than most of the heir to the Russian throne. He spent a great deal of time in his early years in what was known as the Foreign Quarter, or the German Quarter of Moscow. This was a neighborhood that was primarily composed of Western Europeans. There were many German residents, that's why it was often called the German Quarter, but there are also Dutch and a, a, a few 
uh, Scandinavian, also English and Scottish residents of the quarter. This neighborhood really became, becomes a pocket within Russia of modern, some modern technology, also modern customs, and uh, really represents a different, more modern way of life compared to the rest of traditional Russia. Now, Peter met his blonde-haired Dutch mistress, Anna Mons, in this neighborhood. He will have a 12-year relationship with her. He actually considered marrying her and making this Dutch girl the Empress of Russia. However, after the relationship ended after 12 years, Anna's brother was rumored to be having an affair with Peter's wife. Therefore, Peter ordered his beheading and had his head preserved in a jar. Some say that he placed this jar with William Mon's head into the bedroom of his wife as a warning not to cheat on him again. And some say that the jar containing William Mon's head remains in a Russian museum even today. Now, in the foreign quarter, Peter eventually took a Polish-Lithuanian peasant as his mistress sometime around the year 1702 or 1704. The name of this Polish-Lithuanian peasant girl was Marta Skafranskaya. Marta, because she had grown up in the West, was forced to convert to the Russian Orthodox Church, and eventually she took the name of Catherine I. Eventually, surprisingly, unbelievably, this Polish-Lithuanian peasant girl, because she becomes the mistress then wife of the Tsar, Peter the Great, upon Peter's death will actually become the Empress of Russia, even though she's not even Russian. What is important to remember here is that the German quarter had a profound impact on Peter, and he became aware of just how old-fashioned and out-of-date many things were in Russia compared to Western Europe. Now, as a young prince, Peter had actually formed his own personal army. This personal army was composed of his playmates and childhood friends, and they would do military drilling, and they would practice with wooden swords and wooden rifles and do a lot of marching and have pretend battles and so forth. But gradually the boys grew up and received military, professional military training in cavalry and also artillery. So as a result, the company of bombardiers, which were really Peter's childhood playmates, he knew could be very loyal to him, and they become part of his imperial guard, later, uh, later on becoming the Preozazensky and the Semenovsky regiments of the imperial guard. This company of bombardiers, as the imperial guard, uh, part of their charge was, to, was the personal protection of the Tsar. Now, also from a very early age, from his childhood, Peter took a great interest in boats and also in sailing. At a young age, he had been given this boat and had was amazed by uh, the elements of sailing and tacking a sailboat and his various movements against the current. And he became acutely aware of the absence of an effective navy in Russia and therefore was determined when he grew up to create the Russian navy. Now, all of these influences, the German quarter and also the presence of the old believers, the, the interest in sailing, which is almost uh, completely absent in Russia, inspires Peter the Great to actually leave his kingdom and journey west in a very famous trip called the Grand Embassy. It was remarkable that a sitting Russian czar would leave his empire and travel to the West, and not just travel, but travel incognito to uh, take an adopted name. He traveled under the name of Peter Michaelhoff, and he did not want anyone to know who he was. Of course, traveling when you're six foot eight with 200 people at your beck and call, generally it's hard to remain uh, secretive. And therefore, Peter traveled to the West, to Europe, to learn the ways of Europeans so that he could bring them back to Russia. He traveled to several Baltic ports. He journeyed around numerous German cities. He also traveled to Holland, including uh, the cities of Zandam and Amsterdam. He makes it all the way to England, and, 
and then returns by way of Vienna before returning to Russia, a trip that almost lasted uh, almost two years. During that time, he actually got a job as a common carpenter in a Dutch shipyard. He studied and worked uh, as a carpenter and studied shipbuilding and the elements of navigation, uh, which is very significant for him. So again, under his assumed name, he learned all these things, particularly in the Dutch port of Zandam and also moving on uh, into Amsterdam. And in Netherlands, in, the, in Holland, he uh, discovered ice skates, which he was quite fascinated with. He also became aware of just how ill-mannered and uh, how poor the manners uh, were of his Russian servants, including the fact of having numerous drinking contests, drinking an excessive amount of vodka, not knowing how to use silverware at the table, just drinking down their bowl of soup by... Um, just putting their mouth to the bowl, uh, also picking their noses and having farting contests at the table while they're in the Holland and Peter in Holland and Peter's rather embarrassed by this. He's also in, uh, amazed by the attention to dental care that he witnesses in Holland, and would frequently want to participate in dental surgery himself. He also witnessed an autopsy. Uh, and w was amazed by the complexity of the human body. He is also very attracted to the idea of eating salad, which before this was previously unknown. He travels to England and studies urban planning in Manchester and realizes he wants to create his own European city when he returns to Russia. Peter has to cut his trip west short because he hears that once again the Streltsy that elite infantry unit that so harassed him and threatened his life as a child has rebelled again. And therefore, Peter returns very quickly and begins a series of trials and summary executions of those that cut his trip west short and, um, and, and punishes them severely. As a result, over 1,200 were tortured and executed, and in addition, others deported to Siberia. After this event, the Streltsy were disbanded for no longer to harass Peter and thwart his plans. As being, after being inspired in his trip west, Peter embarks on a large-scale modernization of Russia. He really realizes just how far behind his country is, and therefore he's determined to quickly catch it up. One of the first things he imposes was the beard tax. Peter becomes aware that much of the rest of the world, men are clean shaven. Peter comes to think that beards make men look old and traditional. That was certainly the case and even the point for the old believers. And therefore, Peter imposed a beard tax, which if you insisted on keeping your beard, you had to pay a coin, had to pay a, a tax usually of 100 rubles per year. And if you did not pay the tax, if you did not have proof that you had paid the beard tax, perhaps when you were entering a city uh, gate, there would be a, a city official there that would grab your beard and cut it off uh, personally because you had not paid the tax. There's even a story of Peter listening to a courtier report to him, not listening to what he's saying because he's so outraged that the courtier still has a beard and Peter personally walked up and with his great brute physical strength ripped the beard right out of the man's face as he stood before him. Other reforms that Peter imposed on Russia, including the prohibition of kafkans. Kafkans were these long traditional Russian robes that again made Russians seem to be very traditional and old-fashioned. Other reforms that Peter instituted, including the prohibition of arranged marriages, particularly among the boyars, he believed that marriages could be happier if there's an element of consent, which of course stemmed from his own experience of having to marry Udakina Lupukina at the age of 17, his first marriage in which he was very unhappy. He also promoted the economic theory of mercantilism, which is the creation of colonies and the acquisition of gold and having some of the colonies provide raw materials to the mother country. Uh, 
Horrified by the manners of his Russian servants overseas, Peter has a book of etiquette composed that included things that you should and should not do while sitting at the dinner table and in the company of others. And he also famously creates the Russian Navy. Again, there are very few boats in Russia before Peter the Great, and Peter realized that in order to connect with Europe, in in order to create a mercantile fleet, a ship, uh, a fleet of traders to the west, that, that fleet would need a navy to protect those ships. And also, in an effort to secure Russia's southern border, Peter realized that he would need to have a navy in order to fight against the Turks, on the Sea of Azov and also the Black and Caspian Seas. And so as a result, Peter uses the Navy very effectively um, uh, after ordering its construction in 1695 and launching 30 ships against the Ottoman Empire in 1696 manages to capture Azov, which was one of the first and earliest Russian settlements on the Sea of Azov. As a result, Peter uh, continues to expand the Russian Navy, and the Russian Navy is going to be one of the largest in the world by the 19th and 20th centuries. Peter introduced some freedoms uh, for women. Generally, women were treated as second-class citizens in Russia, and Peter did not ban the practice of domestic violence of allowing husbands to beat their wives, but he did institute a rule that husbands could not beat their wives with a dowel, a dense wood stick that was thicker than the husband's thumb. In other words, it had to be a very thin wooden dowel, wooden stick, that was smaller than the husband's thumb. This is, of course, the origin of the expression, the rule of thumb, that husbands could beat their wives as long as the stick was smaller than the rule of thumb of their husbands. Peter also introduced some of the first newspapers in Russia. He also mandated education for the children of the nobles. The first mint is established in Russia and coining money and also increased mining weapons and production and also changed the calendar to the Julian calendar, which was much more prevalent and popular in Europe. Thus, through Peter's efforts, he continues to expand the boundaries of the Russian Empire that his father and his grandfather had initiated in the expansion of Imperial Russia. However, the big problem for Peter that he envisions for the future of Russia was that Russia had no warm water port. It had two significant ports to the north at Archangel and Murmansk. However, for several months of the year, because these ports were located on the Arctic Ocean, they would freeze over. Peter had no port, particularly on the Baltic Sea, that could connect all of a Russian mercantile fleet and its navy to the rest of Europe by traveling on the Baltic Sea. So therefore, Peter is determined to seize land owned by the Kingdom of Sweden that connected that would connect Russia to the Baltic Sea. Therefore, Peter launches what becomes known as the Great Northern War a war that with several stages and several breaks will last for 21 years. Peter targets this key area of land along the Neva River that connected to the Baltic Sea. And so using his new navy, he sends it and his uh, army uh, to the northern regions here and successfully defeats the Kingdom of Sweden and secures this land, giving Peter land and therefore access to build a port along the Neva River, which would access the Baltic Sea. In response, the Kingdom of Sweden and its monarch, Charles XII, is outraged, and therefore he launches an invasion of Russia. He moves against Moscow and also moves into the Ukraine, enjoying one victory after another initially. But much of the campaign occurs in some of the coldest winters in European history. Some historians speculate that some of the campaigns of Charles XII against Peter the Great's Russia in the Great Northern War occurred in a winter that was one of the coldest in the last 500 years in European history. Nevertheless, Peter and the Russian forces are able to confront and repel the forces of Charles XII 
to several strategies. One includes the scorched earth policy, which is the policy of retreating from an invading army, but burning all your supplies, including fields and livestock, so that the invading army cannot live off the land and runs out of supplies and slows its advance. The greatest ally, of course, always for the Russian army is what they nicknamed General Winter. These are the harsh winter conditions, very cold temperatures, and heavy snowfalls that will, of course, impede and bog down an invading army. But the greatest factor in routing the forces of Charles XII occurs at Poltava. This is where Peter gains his greatest military victory and everlasting fame as a czar as well. Battle of Poltava occurred right after this extremely cold winter. Charles XII invaded Russia with 40,000 troops, but because of the winter and defections and disease, his force is decimated, and as a result, half of its side, about 20,000 Sw uh, Swedish troops, faced the Russians at the Battle of Poltava. Now, the day of the battle was actually very hot and humid, and much of the field was obscured by the smoke of the cannon fire. Charles' effectiveness was particularly diminished because he had been struck by a stray bullet two weeks before the battle. Therefore, he wasn't able to stand and really be in command in the battle. And nevertheless, Peter's army is very effective in routing the Swedish forces, and they inflict somewhere around 7,000 casualties on the Swedes, while only suffering about 2,000 casualties on their own. On October 27, 1721, Soon after a peace treaty was made with Sweden, Peter was officially, and for the first time, a czar was proclaimed emperor of all Russia. So as a result, that's a great date to identify the beginning of imperial or the empire of Russia. Now, of course, the purpose of the Great Northern War was to secure a large section of land that would connect to the Baltic Sea, where Peter could build a port, and then eventually he decides he's actually going to build a city there, not just a port. And that city is actually going to become the new capital of Russia. And he's going to name that new city and capital after himself. Thus, we have the origins of the second largest city today in Russia of St. Petersburg. And for a long time, the capital of Russia, St. Petersburg. Now, St. Petersburg is built right near the Baltic Sea, and therefore provides warm enough water that it isn't frozen over for 12 months of the year. But much of St. Petersburg is built on the Neva River. It is a very marshy swamp land that Peter decides to build his city. As a result, the construction of St. Petersburg is an enormous engineering feat that required granite and stone, which was not native to the area, to be brought from all over Russia to form these embankments along the river. And then once these stone embankments or walls are created, then they could pump out the water behind the stone and therefore create land masses where they could construct buildings. As a result, one of the popular taxes or fees that those coming to work in St. Petersburg or those that were coming to live in St. Petersburg were forced to pay was a stone tax that you actually had to bring a piece of stone with you to create the stone embankments that then could be filled with land, drained of the water, and then cities could be built on top of it. It's an enormous undertaking. And of course, the River Neva and its tributaries winded throughout the city. St. Petersburg is sometimes called the city of bones because it literally took tens of thousands of lives drowning and uh, building accidents in the construction of the city. St. Petersburg is also nicknamed the Venice of the North sometimes because of its multiple canals, rivulets, and also bridges that cross key points of the city. Some of the most important buildings from a very early point in the history of St. Petersburg and that still endure today are the Peter and Paul Fortress. This originally had a military uh, uh, significance for the construction of this fortress as a fort to protect the entrances to St. Petersburg. Gradually, it is expanded to a prison where some famous uh, individuals will be imprisoned. There's also a very famous church that is constructed inside of the fortress. 
and as a result, almost every single Romanov monarch from Peter the Great on in Russia's history are buried inside of the Peter and Paul fortress. There's also St. Isaac's Cathedral, which is the largest cathedral in St. Petersburg. It's also the location in where Peter will marry his second wife, Marta Skafaranskaya, and also a very large square in front of this Russian Orthodox Church of St. Isaac's Square. St. Petersburg is also home to the Russian Navy, known as the Admiralty, this large yellow building uh, which headquarters the senior command of the Russian Navy and its very famous submarine service. Eventually, a palace is built in St. Petersburg, which is known as the Winter Palace. The Winter Palace was distinguished from the Summer Palace, which was in Sarkaya Stelo. Ironically, the palace built in St. Petersburg was known as the Winter Palace because this would be where the Tsars would spend their winters, but the Summer Palace, built in Sarkaya Selo, known as the Summer Palace, was only about 45 minutes outside of St. Petersburg. So the difference between the Winter and the Summer Palace is actually not that significant. Now, the Winter Palace will be the official residence for all of the Tsars all the way up until Nicholas II abdicates in February of 1917. After the Winter Palace will have great significance during the Russian Revolution, because as the October Revolution takes place and the Bolsheviks take over in the fall of 1917, Bolshevik guards will storm this building, invade inside the structure, and dissolve the provisional uh, government and arrest its ministers, signaling the end of the provisional government and the establishment of a Bolshevik or communist state in uh, Russia in that pivotal year of 1917. Later on, the Winter Palace is created to be the Hermitage. The Hermitage is the largest art museum in the world with thousands of elements to its collection, including a lot of artwork done by Dutch and Italian artists. Not too far outside of St. Petersburg is the palace that Peter built for himself called the Peterhof. The Peterhof Palace is, um, of course, designed on a lot of after Versailles, it has very famous fountains and also very large gardens similar to Versailles. It has a grand throne room that has elements that look very similar to the Hall of Mirrors located at Versailles. And also um, a lot of European influences on its interior, including this French style interior. But there also combines a mix of Russian architecture, including these onion domes on the Church of the Grand Palace in outside by the gardens and courtyard. But the Peterhof is probably best known for its fountains, its numerous fountains, which are all pressurized and controlled by underground springs. There is no modern technology really used here except some valves and pressure control devices that release all this water that flows regularly through all these fountains, including the very famous Samson and the Lion Fountain located at the Peterhof. Uh, among its gardens and grounds. Now, Peter, of course, has very consequential, very significant uh, time as ruler of Russia, as czar of Russia. He, of course, earns the moniker of the Great for his expansion of the empire, his victory over the Swedes and also the Turks, and because of his trip west and also his efforts to modernize Russia. But as he approached the end of his life and Peter's health gradually began to fail, he became aware that he needed to train up his son to inherit his duties and become czar. The problem for Peter was that as happy as he was in his second marriage to Marta Skavranskaya, who becomes Catherine, she, she does, has not borne him a son in the second marriage. The only son that he has that has survived childhood and is legitimate heir to the throne, a legitimate child, is from his hated first marriage to Edukina Lupukina. Edukina had borne to Peter a son who he took very little interest in, very little training, had not really paid attention to his education. He did not like his first wife, the mother of Alexis, and therefore he paid little attention to Alexei himself. 
Now, Alex A., because he does not have any affirmation or training from his father, really demonstrated none of the engineering or nautical interests of his father. He really prefers uh, to spend most of the time with his mistress. He had an arranged marriage to a European wife who bore him some children. Uh, but he preferred to be with his mistress named Afrosina, and uh, he drank heavily, probably an alcoholic, uh, and was also particularly lazy. And as a result, Alexei became very afraid and very intimidated by his father. In fact, at one point, Alexei is even accused of plotting with other conspirators against his father. Now, eventually, Alexei is charged with this, this uh, charge of conspiracy and treason, and he is tortured. And under torture, he confesses to a conspiracy after, during his interrogation while being tortured. As a result, Peter was given his son's death warrant to sign, where the penalty of treason is always death. And therefore, his father, the Tsar, has a decision to be made what to do with his son. Now, if this was anyone else, of course, Peter would quickly assent to the death of this individual who is accused of conspiring against him. But this indeed is his son, who he does not love and has no interest in. And Peter waffles, and he takes his time deciding whether or not to sign the death warrant. And during that time of waiting and waffling, Alexei dies in prison, probably from the wounds that he had received from being tortured. So as a result... By his two wives, Peter had 14 children, but many of them had died in infancy, including all the male heirs. So there is no strong male heir to inherit the throne after the death of Peter the Great. Now, in the winter of 1723, Peter, who had never really enjoyed overall really great health, had begun to feeling great pains uh, and great health difficulties, and as a result, he's diagnosed with an infection in his urinary tract. And in the summer of 1724, a team of doctors performed surgery. They, re they released upwards of four pounds of blocked urine in his bladder. He remained bedridden for weeks, and then eventually he died of a bladder infection at the age of 52 in 1725. Still today, he is buried in the Peter and Paul Fortress. This is his sarcophagus. Uh, which is above ground on the floor of the church next to all the other significant czars that come after him. Sh shortly after Peter the Great's term, towards the end of the century, Catherine the Great, the Tsarina of Russia, will commission the construction of the famous Bronze Horseman, which is a very large statue commemorating the very successful, very consequential reign of Peter the Great. The statue still resides in St. Petersburg today. Without a strong male heir to inherit the throne, the throne passes to Peter's second wife, Marta Skavranskaya. Marta Skavranskaya, who uh, ironically had been this Polish-Lithuanian peasant girl, rises to become Peter's mistress and then his eventual wife. So this young peasant girl who had no Russian blood in her now ascends to become the Empress of Russia, known as Catherine the uh, Catherine the First. We know that Peter and Catherine generally had a very intimate marriage. There are many letters still uh, existing today that show Peter's great affection for Marta. It's interesting that Peter had her dye her hair, her blonde hair, to black because he didn't want to remember his previous Dutch mistress Anna Mons, who had blonde hair. Now, Marta had converted to the Russian Orthodox Church and took the name of Catherine when she became the Empress Consort of Peter the Great and then eventually Empress Catherine I. Catherine was known for her ability to calm Peter's frequent temper tantrums and rages, and eventually she will bore Peter 12 children, all of whom who died in childbirth except two daughters, Anna and Elizabeth. Catherine ascended to the Russian throne upon Peter's death and became the first female monarch of Russia. It's interesting is she's the first female monarch of Russia in this pivotal century of the 18th century, but she will become the first of several consequential, very significant, powerful female monarchs who would come to dominate 
the 18th century Russian throne. This would include Empress Anna, Empress Elizabeth, and also, most significantly, Empress Catherine II. However, Catherine was generally mostly controlled by her advisors, and she only rules for approximately two years before she dies of tuberculosis. Thus, once again, the Russian throne is thrown into a bit of confusion of who will inherit the throne, who will be the heir to the throne, after the inability of Peter to produce a strong male heir who will inherit the throne. In our next lecture, we'll examine this time of confusion after the reign of Peter the Great and Catherine I, and the eventual accession, ascension of Catherine II, very strong Tsarina and monarch to the Russian throne, and the continuance of imperial Russia into the 19th century.